people come together, strangers, neighbors, the blood is one, children of generations of every nation, his kingdom come. Don't let your heart be trouble hold your head up I don't feel no evil fix your eyes on this one truth God is madly in love with you take courage hold on be strong remember where our help comes from oh. Let's lift his name. Jesus, our redemption, our salvation is in his blood. Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom come. Don't let your heart drop Hold your head up I don't feel evil Fix your eyes on this one truth God's mighty in love with you Take courage, hold on, be strong Remember where our help comes from As the walls come down. Come on. Swing right where you have it. Let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. With his children, clean hands, your hearts with grace. Jesus, come on. So why will you hear that? Let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All the children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Swing wide, swing wide, for you have Let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All his children, clean hands, true hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Everything with breath, repeat the sound. All his children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. It's his name. Jesus, our redemption, our salvation is in his blood. Jesus, 
light of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom
joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be yeah. I can see the light in the darkness As the darkness bows to Him I can hear the roar in the heavens As the space between west and I can feel the ground shake beneath us As the prison walls cave in Nothing stands between us Nothing stands between us There'll be another in the fire Standing next to me There'll be another in the water Holding back the sea And should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me I count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be Count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be Amen. Amen. Counting joy in a battle. That doesn't make sense when you think about it. Joy in the battle. But when, when you know who has already won the battle, it makes perfect sense. Psalm 84, I was reading this earlier this weekend, and I don't know about you or what, what your favorite book to read is in the Bible, or maybe you don't have one, you haven't discovered what's your favorite yet, but it's all good. <laughs> um, some of it hurts, um, but it's good. And the Psalms are one of my favorite books. Um, there's so much praise filled in the Psalms, so much crying out, um, so much lament, if you know what that word means. I'm just crying out. But I love how the author points to the Father so much. In Psalm 84, I'll just start at verse 1. It says, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of heaven's armies. I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the court to the Lord. And you know, maybe that, that statement doesn't apply to you right now in your life. I was talking to Josh about this earlier, how some things are objective and, and subjective. Objective things never, they don't change. Like our God is a mighty fortress that never changes. That truth is always true. But the author's writing, I long and I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord. Maybe that's not true for you right now. And that's okay. It is okay. I've, I've sung songs before where I said, God, I'm madly in love with you. And I, I wasn't at the moment. I was mad. It's okay. He knows your heart better than anybody. He made it. He formed it. He crafted it. But if you keep pushing along and you keep walking hand in hand with the Father, I promise you there's going to be a time where you can sing that and read this and it'd be objective for you. It'd be truth. You might not be able to see that now, but keep walking, keep holding his hand. Continuing along, it says, with my whole being, body and soul, I will shout joyfully to the living God. Well, some of you might have a worship history or culture for yourself where you don't shout, you don't, because you, you kind of don't want to scare anybody that's around you. Well, now is the perfect time Perfect time. Scream all you want in your living room. <laughs> I promise you it's not that many people. They're just loud in here. But shout joyfully. When you start thinking about all the Lord has done, you can't help but do it. I know you've heard me before. If you've, if you've tuned in or been here before, woo! That's, that's my shout. I just don't want to blow the microphones out or get Stuart mad at me. Woo! You can't contain it. And now's your time. Worship, you can worship more freely now than ever if you've been scared to do it around people. So I encourage you to do that. 
as we enter into this next song of worship, and there's no one higher, no one greater than our God. That is objective. It is truth, and it never will change. Pray with me. Father God, you are a redeemer, defender. You're majestic in wonder, Father. You reign with love forever. Your grace and your mercy knows no bounds. Father, fill the rooms today with your presence. As we fill it with praise for you, you fill it even more with your presence. Move in, around, and through us, Jesus. Woo. We shout joyfully with all of our being, body, and soul to you, Father, in thankfulness and the joy that which only you can give. And we love you so much. Father, I pray for somebody experiences your love for the first time. Amen. Your grace for me is 
Church, I am so glad that you are with us. I hope you enjoyed that time of worship, um, and I, I hope you're enjoying our nine o'clock service right now. Uh, I just want you guys to know, man, I love you and I miss you, um, but I am still so thankful that we can get together in this digital way. And uh, if you call the Rock home, thank you so much for tuning in and doing this. Uh, we sent out a push notification and an email this week, and so many of you responded. So many of you talked about how um, just these services have helped you in this time of crisis in the midst of this pandemic. Uh, so I'm so thankful that you've been able to be a part of what we're continuing to do as The Rock. Services haven't been canceled. As you know, we are actively following the Lord and uh, loving him and loving people and doing something about it. And if you're new with us, man, let me thank you for being with us this morning. Uh, I'm so thankful that you've taken the time just to join in with us. And I would love to hear from you. If you do me a favor and just text us right now, uh, you can text a number. It's coming up up on the screen. It's 843-444-2144. And all you got to do is text the word CONNECT to that number. If you text the word CONNECT, then what you're doing is you're letting us know that you're new here. Or if you have prayer requests or anything like that, you can do the same thing. But especially if you're new here, we would love to hear from you. Um, in this time, all right? And, and then the other thing I want to do is, is I need to hear from some of you teenagers and college students. So listen, right now, if you're a teenager or a college student, I need your help. I'm working on a message in the future, and I need your help to prepare it. So here's what I want you to do is I want you, again, if you're a teenager or if you're a college student, I want you to message me, okay? Now, you can either message me on Instagram 
Uh, that's my Instagram handle, or this is my cell phone number, 843-516-2200, all right? So if you're a teenager or a college student, just message me. Uh, just give me your name, and, and then I will reply. And uh, I've got a little project I'm working on that I would love to have your help with. And uh, it's real simple. Don't worry. Uh, you're not going to get yourself into, uh, like, going, oh, now, what's the preacher want, okay? It's going to be simple. It'll be easy. But I would love to have your help. So if you're a teenager or college student, message me this morning, either on Instagram or on my cell phone number, because I would love to uh, just let you know of something I need for a sermon, all right? And then the last thing I want to say before we dive into the message is um, if you regularly attend The Rock, I want to thank you for the way that you give. Um, Because of your gifts, we've been able to do some amazing ministry. Uh, One, we've been able to do services like this online. Um, One, we've been able to do some things um, you know, out in our community. I want you to know that, that because of your giving this week, we have been able to, to uh, deliver six truckloads of food uh, to CAP, which is one of our food banks here in town in Horry County. Uh, so I want to thank you for that. The coffee bar will continue to receive food. We'll continue to give that out, but six truckloads have been given out. Uh, also this week, over $3,000 has been given away to some of our ministry partners here locally and globally, and also to some people in need because of the way you give. And then I also got this card in the mail from one of our givers, and I just loved it, and I'm just going to read the second paragraph. It says this, it's scary being on a fixed income and watching my retirement savings plunge, but I know this investment will give myself and others a priceless return. I love that this lady who's on a fixed income, she still feels the need to to be obedient to the Lord and to give. And I want you to know when you do give like that, then you are making an investment in God's kingdom and also in others. So I want to encourage you to continue to do that. All right, guys, that's about it. We're going to dive into the message. Uh, This morning, we're going to hear from Scott, who's one of our pastors on staff. Uh, He he leads our Aner campus and then also does a lot of leadership on our online campus and in our digital discipleship. He's got some great things for you this morning. Uh, So let's just go ahead and dive into the message. Well, hey, Rock family, again, we're just so thankful that you're here. So, I love it. That's a really loud 13 people in this room. So, anyway, wherever you are right now, maybe you're at your, your house, maybe you're watching on a device, maybe you're connecting with some friends, or maybe you're just somewhere, this is kind of even new for you, we just are so thankful that you're tuning in, because we're in a conversation about grace, Now, a few weeks ago at Easter, we began this conversation, and last week, we began talking about grace as a kind of a, through two different ways. First, through a metaphor of a table. And so, last week, if you were with us, or maybe you want to go back and check that out after you're watching this, uh, Josh was talking about how we are just a red solo cup, a china, paper plate kind of a church where everybody gets a seat at the table, everybody's welcome, and how we looked at Jesus loves to eat with sinners. And so, we want to make sure you check that out, because we're going to build on that tonight, because there were two metaphors, or one was scripture, um, that we're going to look at right now in just a second, where there's kind of an overarching theme for this uh, conversation about grace. Now, when we started writing this sermon series, we started talking about um, let us say grace, which is what happens around a table. And so everything that we're talking about happens around a table. And one of the things we talk about grace is we want to make sure that everybody gets a seat at that table. Now, the verse that we're kind of hinging everything on comes from a book in the New Testament, uh, the book of Hebrews. So I'm going to jump up here on the screen. I'm going to put this so that we can read this uh, together. 
Now, there is actually um, kind of an admonition here. Um, and there's two parts to this verse. I want to kind of just read through this with you. Look after each other. And that's kind of what the gracious thing to do, right? Just to begin by looking after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. That's our hope. Number one, that nobody misses out on the grace of God. We want everybody to get the, the, what God has given to us and we can extend it to you. Now tonight, I want to press into that second part um, of this verse because when we talk about everybody gets a seat at the table, but sometimes there's a problem. And there's something that could block the grace, and there's something that can block our not only receiving, but the giving of grace away. Now, what's interesting in this, in this text, in Hebrews chapter 12, he says, watch out. So you look out for people, but then you watch out for things that can trip us up. So watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. So... What we have in this verse, if we're going to welcome everybody to the table and we want to extend grace to everybody, there's some things that can block the flow of grace to us and to others. Now, what's interesting, the writer of Hebrews, and we don't know exactly who wrote Hebrews, we have some guesses, but the writer says there's one thing in particular that can block grace. And it's interesting, um, in the NLT, it calls it a poisonous root of bitterness. Isn't it? That's kind of the problem, right? I know that's an easy problem for for humans, and that's the kind of the problem that we have when it comes to giving away grace, is usually the one thing that blocks us from being able to give away grace is, well, I don't want to, right? It's that bitterness, like, uh uh-uh, not, not, no. I remember our last exchange. There's some bitterness. But it it always starts as like a small little seed, kind of like a, a little flower that comes up to the crack of a sidewalk, It just forces its way right through circumstances. So we have to look out for this poisonous root of bitterness that grows up to trouble you. And here's the thing. He says, it's not just about you. It corrupts many. That that, that, the thing about grace when it comes to us, it always has implications for other people. And that what God wants to do with us and in us and through us has implications for everyone around us. And so what we're going to dive into tonight is this conversation about grace and making sure that we are aware of any poisonous root in our life that might need to be unrooted so that we can receive grace and give it away. And so we're going to kind of jump into this, but I just want to talk about the problem with grace is actually right here in the book of Hebrews. It says there's this bitter root because there's something about the human condition that we're just sometimes bitter or there's something inside of us that blocks and maybe we can call it pride we can call it a lot of different things and it's normal it's normal for humans to kind of react this way i'll just tell you that that for me i know a kind of normal disposition sometimes is not to want to be able to give away grace and and it's normal this goes all the way back to in in the garden of eden is kind of there's something that kind of springs forth and kind of grows and causes a separation Now, I would say when it's giving grace away, sometimes it's hard. Because I I would tell you that when it comes to giving grace away, um, here's the problem. We want to give grace away in proportion to fairness, which really isn't grace at all, is it? It's like, well, I'll I'll be gracious to people who are gracious to me. But Scripture says it's easy to forgive people that have forgiven you, and it's easy to be nice to people who are nice to you. But what about people who hate you? And so here's the thing about grace is we want to give away grace in proportion to fairness. But I just want to tell you that there's a lie that little, maybe for some of us, there's one lie that has crept into our lives. I know it's crept into culture and it's a poisonous root and it's a lie from the pit of hell. And here it is. You ready? Life ain't fair. All right. So the lie is this. People have someone said life is fair, but that's a lie. Life ain't fair. And to quote my friend Sturgill Simpson, life ain't fair and the world's mean. And so I'm going to tell you that there was a lie that we've all bitten into that it should be fair. And the reason that we hold on to fairness and want everything to be fair, that inhibits our ability to be gracious. Now, I would say that sometimes out in the world, it's, it's easy to, to, matter of fact, it's kind of easier to give away grace to people in the world because we're conditioned um, in a way. Because here's the thing about grace. Grace has a hard time thriving in our culture 
Not only because it's about fairness, because here's the thing. We live in a culture that's all about competition and comparison. But grace is an act of compassion. So here's the problem tonight. I want to kind of dive right into this. That when com- competition and comparison are the norm, compassion is rare. And the reason we can't be gracious is because we're always competing with other people. We're always in competition and we're always comparing. And comparison is the thief of joy and therefore we just don't want to give it away. Now, this is our condition. But here's, I'm going to say this now and I'll repeat it later. This isn't a problem for God. Because our God is not in competition with anyone. God doesn't compare himself to anyone. Therefore, God can be gracious. God can love uninhibited because God is not in competition with anybody. And God doesn't compare himself to anybody. So this is one of the ways that we understand this is kind of our problem and this is our norm. Now, I'm going to talk about um, a story in scripture to kind of, you know, anchor what we're talking about. That last, last one we talked about eating with people who were sinners. Tonight, we're going to look at a, a scripture. And this weekend, we're going to be kind of unpacking this story of eating with Friends, because I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes it's easier to forgive people out in the wild. The guy who cuts us off in traffic, it's kind of easier to kind of go like, well, whatever, must be having a bad day. But here's where sometimes grace is the hardest place to extend. Sometimes it's right in our own homes. Now, I, I, I just want to, I want to talk to you for just a minute. You might be sitting on your couch right now. And this conversation may hurt. Because sometimes it's hard to love people in our own homes. And let me explain why. When you love someone intimately, love is giving someone the capacity to destroy you and trusting that they won't. Let me say that again. Because when you love someone, you're giving them the capacity to destroy you. They know everything about you. They know your insides. They know your heart. They know everything. And you're trusting they won't use it against you. And when they do, it hurts the worst. I, I know maybe I'm not alone in that, that, that sometimes that's, that's when it hurts the most. And that's why sometimes grace is so hard in our homes. And maybe right now on your couch, you're going like, oh, man, he brought it up. It, but we have to. Like, like Kalok said, some of the word hurts, but it's good. It's good medicine. So tonight we're going to look at a, a passage of scripture where Jesus actually ate with some friends. And we're going to look at how grace was unpacked and shared amongst them. Now, this passage comes from the New Testament. This is a third book in the New Testament. One of the Gospels, one of those biographies of Jesus um, called Luke. In the 10th chapter, um, it says this. Now, as they were traveling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Now, uh, this, and this is a little bit of an advertisement, okay, because there is so much I want to say about this verse. This verse 38 right here, I want to go so deep into why they were in Bethany, where they were coming from, why they were traveling, why this was a safe house, why this was a ministry place, but I can't. So here's what we're doing. Sometimes when we get to the discover part of a message, there's so much more that we want to say and so much more that we want to discover, but we don't have time. We're going to make time. So on Tuesday nights at 7.30, I'm going to be broadcasting live, and we're going to discover more. And this is one of the things we're going to discover more about. I want to go deeper on that, okay? There's so much in that one sentence, but not now. Later, okay? So they are at someone's house for a really big reason, and these are trusted friends. They're they're trusted friends because this is a place where Jesus would have been with some... It's really people he felt comfortable around. He loved them. This is Martha's house. Had a sister by the name of Mary and a brother named Lazarus. Maybe you've heard those names before. And Jesus really developed a relationship. And so Martha opens up her home. And so Jesus comes in. Now, the thing about eating with friends, when people come over, there's always a lot to do, right? There's so much to do. There's more to do than we have time to do in all the preparations And there are two sisters. I just want to read through this very quickly, and then we're going to kind of go right back through it. So Martha opens opens up her home. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. So she's there. Jesus is spending time. He's not just passing through. He's there, and he's 
speaking. What he's speaking about, we don't know. This is a private teaching. We don't know what he was saying, but she was listening. We'll come back to this. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came up to him and said, like most of us would, Lord, don't you, do you not care that my sister has left me to do everything and I'm serving alone? And I love this. Tell her to get up. Like, she doesn't give Jesus a chance to answer. Like, then tell her to get up and help me. But Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and bothered about so many things. But only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Now, typically, typically this passage is wrapped up in a sermon about worship and work. And typically, this is a place where we would pit one sister's behavior against another sister's behavior and say, look how good one is and look how bad the other one is. But that wouldn't be very gracious. It's not that it's just not gracious. It's actually not in good reading of the whole of Scripture. Because here's what we understand. Yes, there's some aspects. We'll get into how this may be part of the story. And, but here's the thing. What Jesus is going to do in this story is be gracious. Jesus doesn't pit one sister against another. He offers grace, but he does it in different ways. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to show how Jesus offered grace to two sisters in two different ways in proportion to what they needed, not what was fair. So I'm going to run right back through this, and we're going to talk about Mary. When I think about Mary, there's a a quote from St. Augustine who says it this way, God gives where he finds empty hands. St. Augustine lived about 1,600 years ago, and he says that the best place for God to work is in empty hands. Now, that's a a quote when I think about Mary, and I think about kind of her position. She's sitting at the Lord's feet. So when we talk about, well, where was grace for Mary, for this one friend? Mary was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. Now, friends, i got to be honest with you. That's grace. Because God doesn't have to come into our lives. God doesn't have to be available to us. God doesn't have to speak to us. But God does. He chooses to. And that God is speaking and God is loving and just pouring wisdom into me. He's being so gracious because he's sharing the word. He's giving wisdom. He's giving life. And he's giving bread of heaven to Mary. That's the grace. That's the grace that God's given Mary, and Mary is open-handed, and she's receiving. And so why that's important, and this is a little bit about worship and work, but what, what Mary is doing is she's worshiping at her Savior's feet, and she knows that this is the rabbi who's giving the bread of heaven, and he's so gracious to do it in the family's home. I want to tell you right now, if you're at your home right now, and, and, and you are just wanting to taste the bread of heaven. Maybe right now you want to get ready in the service and you want to do communion with your family and just experience bread of heaven together. This would be a good time and a good day to do that. But this isn't the only way God was sharing grace in this home because let's take a, a look at Martha. Now, Martha was distracted with all her preparations. Now, I got to be honest with you. This is where most women go like, yeah, I mean, obviously, right? This is, she's got to get it. I mean, th- this is the, the God of heaven, the Lord Almighty, is eating in your home, right? There's some things you probably would want to do. And she's busy with all the distractions. But here, I want to take us back to this Hebrews 12, 15. Even in the presence of the Lord, a little poisonous root can sprout. Even though the Lord is with us, he doesn't save us from everything he stands with us. And and we don't know the backstory here, and we don't know what was going on. We don't know exactly what this exchange looked like. We have a very small slice. But here's what we know, that Martha, you know, respectively is going like Mary. And I'm sure that she didn't interrupt Jesus on the first try. I'm sure she said Mary many times before she actually went to Jesus and asked for help. And I'm sure she was frustrated. And, and, And I know that she was frustrated because here's what Luke as the writer does. I'm going to show you this. There's two things that he does to to point us to to understanding where grace was applied for Mary. Lord, don't you know? Don't you care that my sister has left me to do all this serving alone? Tell her to help me. 
But the Lord answered, and this is, this is where grace steps in. Now, on Easter morning, I, I talked about how Jesus spoke Mary of Magdala's name. And how gracious he was to break through on sunrise, uh, Easter morning, to, to break through the, and give her clarity. In this moment, when God speaks, it's always gracious. And, and God says, Mary, and he doesn't just say it once. Uh, here, here's what I, I, I love about this. Martha. Martha. And at this moment, there's this kind of Martha, like, hey, sh- Martha. There's not any rebuke here. This is just friends. Martha, listen, Martha. Now, I, I want to show you what else is going on here. Jesus says, you're worried and bothered about so many things. And Jesus is saying, like, I notice. I notice that you're worried and I notice that you're bothered. And, and so he speaks Martha's name twice and he says, I notice that you're worried and you're bothered. And Jesus always addresses the things that we need to hear. Martha, listen. What Mary is doing, she has chosen the good part, the Agatha, the good part. And here's what he's saying about this. This is what she needs right now. This is the goodness that she needs. Now, I, I want to make a caveat about exactly what Martha, and I want to make a defense for Martha, because a lot of times people throw Martha under the bus right here, and I don't think that's fair, because here's why. When you look at the whole of Scripture, um, what, what actually Martha says, like, don't you know that I've been serving and she's not having? That word serving happens to be this word diaconus, which happens 34 other times in the New Testament And every other time, we translate it as ministry. What Martha was doing was ministry. What she's doing was actually the Lord's work. And so it wasn't that it was a bad thing, and it wasn't that it was was simply secondary to the primary. And so in in defense to Martha, she's actually doing. But Jesus says, listen, what Mary has chosen is the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Now, now let me just, just look straight at this camera for a moment and just talk to you about why this is for us right now. Beside these 13 people right here, you're not here. We're not worshiping as we normally worship on all our physical campus. But here's the thing. Our God is unstoppable. We serve a spirit who is immutable. And the goodness of worship will not be taken away from us. We will continue to worship because Jesus said to a woman at the well in John 4, verse 24, there will be a day such as today when people will worship me in spirit and truth. On that mountain or in Jerusalem, it won't matter that I will be wherever they are. And no one can take that from them. Not COVID, not quarantine, nothing. What you're doing right now, when you're worshiping with your family, the Lord says, no one can take that from you. What Mary has chosen, the world cannot touch. But Martha, this is primary. So what Jesus is doing here, he's actually kind of helping them, uh, you know, reorder their, their um their life because where the grace is that Jesus is teaching and any time that Jesus is teaching there's so much grace and he's trying to teach okay what Mary is doing is the primary and ministry and work is always secondary it's not that it's a bad thing and something those happen but here's what Jesus is being so gracious to tell them you can't give away what you don't have and if you're not willing to receive grace first You can't give it away. And so I want to just challenge you right now. This is kind of the moment when we look at what Jesus is being so gracious to teach his friends Mary and Martha. And I'm sure Lazarus was there listening and the disciples and everybody was around listening to this. And Martha is busy trying to get all these fellas fed and it makes sense. But he's like, Martha, I'm right here. Don't miss it. Worship is primary. Because Jesus knew there would be a moment that he would not be with them anymore. Martha, for now, let's worship. For what Mary's doing, no one's, if I'm no longer here, you know, you can't feed me if I'm here, but if you're worshiping, no one can take that from you. 
But there's this moment when I, I feel like people kind of look harsh on Martha and, and kind of, and, and it's true that we're learning from these. And, but here's the thing. God is being so gracious and so tender with both of these women. He, he's teaching and, he, and, and allowing, and Mary's just sitting there soaking it up. And he's so tender with Martha. Martha, Martha. And he's so gracious with his time and his words. And, and so what I want to tell you today is that there, there was this bitter root Somewhere in those ladies' relationship, and maybe it was because their personalities were so different. Maybe, you know, they were just, you know, Enneagram different numbers. Ask my wife, she'll tell you. And so, like, there was a moment where, where sometimes we, it's going to have some friction. But what Jesus does, he steps in, and, and what we learn is he's more, he's more concerned about uprooting any poisonous root in that home. Martha, Martha. And I'm sure there was a side conversation here, and Jesus offered some, some, some help and some healing to make sure that whatever poisonous root of bitterness between these ladies wouldn't hurt them any. Because you, have you ever been at a dinner party where there was an argument, and then the party was ruined for everybody? You think Jesus wants that to happen at the, the house right there in Bethany? And so Jesus is saying, like, Martha, listen, there, we have so much ministry to do together. But for now, if we're going to squash the bitterness, let's worship. And so the questions that we're going to respond with today and wherever you are and just kind of, you know, I don't, I don't know where you are and what's going on in your life. And I don't, you know, speaking to people, especially right in your living room, I don't know the dynamic of, of what's happened in your life and what's happened in your, in your house. But I want to go back to that verse in, in Hebrews twelve fifteen. We don't want anyone to miss the grace, even right in our own home. And so there's some work that has to be done. We have to find whatever that, that poisonous root of bitterness is and uproot it. Because it just doesn't distract and hurt us. It hurts everyone. And so there's a way that we're going to respond right now that I, I'm going to ask these two questions. And so the questions are this. Where in your life is there something that needs to be uprooted? I, I don't know where that is, and I don't know what it is, but maybe there's just an issue in your home. And like I said, this might hurt. There might, after this service, you, you might just need to have a conversation. And you may need to, to say, there's this thing that's between us. And so here, here's where we're going to go right now. Like I said, you can't give away what you don't There might be something that needs to be uprooted in your life so that you can receive grace. Remember what Jesus was actually teaching them. There's two things we can do. We can do ministry and we can do work. Excuse me, we can do worship and we can do ministry, but worship is always primary because if you're not connected to God, if there's anything that, could, that just keeps us away from God, from receiving his grace, we can't give it away. And so here's the question. I don't, I don't know where you are and what's going on in your life, but I want to invite you to think about this. Is there anything that's keeping you from receiving the grace of God? And I want to encourage you, two things. Number one, this is easy for God. God's not in competition with anyone. God doesn't compare himself with anyone. Therefore, compassion is easy. When I read this scripture with Mary and Martha, I see how gentle Jesus is to speak truth in love. And I want to speak some truth and love right now. There might be some soul searching and some praying and some digging that things in your life that need to be uprooted. There might be some things that you need to stop. I don't know what that step is for you today. Maybe it's to, like you just want to take a step of faith and confess your sins. And know, But here's the thing. Know this, that our God is gracious. He is ready to forgive. He is ready to give grace to you. And maybe that may be a huge concept for you, but I want to tell you this. God gives to those with empty hands. And you uproot and you take anything out of your hands that's keeping you and keeping God at a distance. God will fill the places that have been prepared. I want to encourage you to think about that. And then there's another question. Once we receive the grace of God, which is the worship, and we're there, we do that through worship, we respond with grace. So, what do we do with what's been given? 
maybe you're at one with God. Maybe you know the grace of God and you're just filled with how gracious our God is. But what about the person sitting beside you? What about your neighbor? Is there any poisonous root of bitterness between you? And if so, I just want to encourage you to uproot it. And that might be you physically may have to do something. You may have to stop something. You may have to have a conversation. It might just be that we say, I'm sorry. I want to encourage you to respond in grace tonight. And wherever you are and what's going on in your life, maybe you want to, um, you know, take a step towards Jesus right now. And you want to respond to his grace. I want to tell you right now. You have a Father in heaven who loves you so much. He wanted to give you his grace, and he gave you his only son to come down and to live a life and to die a death that he didn't deserve so we can find the grace that we don't deserve. And we just want you to respond to that tonight because we want everybody at the table. Lastly, friends, as we get ready to go right back into some worship time where we're going to have a chance to really just kind of be in the moment There might be a conversation or a next step that you want to respond. You might want to go to the kitchen right now and grab some stuff for communion and have communion together and make sure that you are worshiping together in your home. We encourage you to do that. You might want to connect. You might want to, uh, you know, connect online right now in the chat box. You might want to text to the word. And and you you want to, you know, schedule a baptism. And that's your next step. We want to help you do that. Our baptistry is open and and we can make that happen. Wherever you are to right now, I want to pray that you receive the grace of God because you can't give away what you don't have. And when you receive the free gift of grace from Jesus, you give it away like you're made of it. You give it away like the grace will never run out because here's the thing, you can't give it all away because our God is that good. Friends, Wherever you are, let's respond to the grace of Jesus right now. In my mother's womb, you formed me with your hands, known and loved by you. Before I took a breath, when I died, it Lord remind me, I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter, I'm the canvas and the clay. You make all things work together for my future and for my good. You make all things work together for your glory and for your name.
There's a healing light just beyond the clouds. Though I've walked through fire, I see clearly now. I know nothing has been wasted, no failure or mistake. You're an artist and a potter in the canvas and the clay. You make all things work together for my future and for my good. You make all things work together for your glory and for. been wasted, no failures or mistakes. You're an artist and the potter, I'm the canvas and the clay. When I doubt it, Lord, remind me how I was fully made. You're an artist and the potter, I'm the canvas and the clay. And I know nothing has been wasted, no failure or mistake. You're an artist and a potter, I'm the canvas and the clay. You make all things work together for my future and for my good. You make all things work together for your glory and for your name. When I doubt it, Lord, remind me I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas and the clay. I know nothing has been wasted, no failure or mistake. You're an artist and a potter, I'm the canvas and the clay. You're not finished with me. 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 No. You're not finished with me. You're not finished with me. Lord. You're not finished with me. You're not finished with me. You're not finished with me yet. You're not finished with me, no. You're not finished with me yet. You're not finished with me. You're not finished with me yet. You're not finished with me, Lord. You're not finished with me. 